Um, if you can give us a sort of very truncated sketch of, in both of your professional lives, how you became interested in questions of the interface between science and spirituality, medicine, uh, medicine and the sacred. Um, and I'll guess, I guess starting with you, if you would, sure. Praveen. Yeah, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. And thank you for, for having and hosting me here at Dartmouth. It's really special to, to be here. Uh, save the best for last, I guess, among the Ivies. Um, don't tell anybody at Cornell I said that. Um, I, I grew up as a Hindu, practicing Hindu, um, quite orthodox. Um, and then in college, I actually uh, sort of put together a comparative religious course for myself. I'll refrain from sharing all the details of how I got to that space. Uh, but uh, I had a desire to become a little bit more sensitive to the truth claims that are being made by all the different traditions that are out there. And I had the privilege of being able to put together a sort of course of study like that for myself, in, in addition to what the major that I was studying. Um, and it was an incredibly intellectually rich time for me. And during that time, I became a Christian, uh, which was the last thing that I thought would happen because I think of all the faith traditions, that was the one I probably had the most animosity toward growing up. Um, and so that's also probably for another discussion. Uh, but that preface is important to, to say that um, I really didn't, I didn't grow up in a Christian tradition. Um, and uh, so I didn't really have a lot of the uh, background and baggage, however you want to take that, the positive or the negative. Um, so I had the opportunity to think afresh a little bit about what the faith meant to me, um, how I understood it. And um, in doing so, and, and in looking around to see how other people were engaging with that faith tradition, um, I was a little surprised by the tension between um, people of faith in the Christian community, particularly in the evangelical community, and science. Um, and while there are some prominent individuals who have their legs dipped into both pools, it really did seem like there was this ever-growing chasm between the sort of faith-based worldview and uh, practicing scientists. And here I was trying to study to become a practicing scientist, uh, but uh, an earnest and nascent and devoted Christian. And so um, it seemed like a clash of worlds, and was I really going to have to choose between God and science? Because that was the question that was being regularly put before me. Um, so I became very invested in trying to understand the interface between science and faith, um, and did a lot of that wrestling really on my own. Um, and so on the other side of that, and I'm still wrestling of course, uh, but I really am passionate about providing safe spaces for other students and lay community members and whomever to come and wrestle together with me. Uh, that there's no question that is out of bounds. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to be unsure. Uh, that certainty is often a myth. Um, and that uh, let's just journey and grow together. So it's, it's something that I've been trying to do informally um, in my capacity as a professor uh, but also formally through these kinds of programs and Veritas and other forums uh, that provide this kind of safe space for discussion. I was, I was raised on the Navajo Reservation and um, sort of accidentally wound up at Dartmouth as an undergraduate, um, challenged by a guy I was dating who was from Princeton and native who wanted me to come back to Princeton and I asked him how many natives there were there, and he said five, and I'm not go I said, I'm not going anywhere where there's only five native people. And then he pointed me at Dartmouth, who had 50, and that was 10 times more than five, so I said, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> be that as it may, and I'm not always sure that was the best place for me to be, uh, I do credit Dartmouth with, uh, with my career and with my, my life trajectory, uh, and I've come and gone here on several occasions. I. Uh, came back after I would, had finished all my training to uh, join the medical school and uh, be their dean of students and admissions, um, and, uh, and then was asked to leave in 2009 out of the blue for no reason at all except maybe money because they were going through a, a lot and they had to turn over leadership and pay people less when they replaced them. Uh, and so I have been very angry at Dartmouth, but then I was invited back to give their baccalaureate address in 2017, and I'm like, oh, that's wild. And then I get asked back here, and I come and go. So um, 
my love-hate relationship with the institution continues. My daughter is a 20, and uh, she also has a love-hate relationship and has had a variety of incidents that were not pleasant on this campus, but she does love the fine arts, which she's a major of, and Native American studies, and she worships Professor Dutu, who's right over here. Uh, so how did I, I don't know, honestly, if, I, if you had to ask. I, uh, I came to Dartmouth, and I um, came right off the reservation, and uh, immediately did badly in sciences. Uh, got my first D of my entire life in calculus and a C minus in chemistry and thought I'm too stupid to do anything science-y. So I went over to psychology uh, as well as sociology and native studies. And um, last, one of the last courses I took was in neuroanatomy and um, I fell in love with it. And I thought, oh, I think I'll go get a PhD in neurosciences found myself as a research assistant in a neurobiology lab, and they talked me into trying med school, and I blushed and put my head down because I remembered those terrible grades, and yet they, by that time I had learned how to study and I had learned how to think, and I went to UNM and did my pre-meds and had all A's and B's, and the next thing I knew I was at Stanford and uh, going into medicine and was never planning to do surgery, but I met a native surgeon, and uh, he taught me everything he knew before I formally entered my surgical training at Stanford and uh, uh, walked onto the Stanford surgical rotation and already knew how to do their operations and how to care for their patients and they gave me honors and invited me to train at their surgical program. Pretty weird. Um, so I spent 10 years at Stanford and then, um, and then went back to New Mexico to work with my tribe and I realized that uh, how I had been trained was not the way to care for Native patients because it did not include a uh, respect for their culture and their values and beliefs and that as long as it didn't, they were unlikely to come to, to see me as a practitioner unless it was at the very last minute and they were doing very badly and that was not a great thing to be doing because um, uh, patient outcomes were not good that way. And so we started doing empirically adjusting our medical practice, our surgical practice, to be inclusive of their, their ways of being, um, being very much a listening uh, uh, group, a group that uh, let them lead the way, a group that invited their own uh, traditional practices to come alongside us and, and, and uh, heal them as well and um, with respect for pretty much everything Navajo. Uh, and it went into every part of how we practiced, even bringing sacred objects to the operating room. Uh, and then I started to realize that Navajo ways of thinking and being could actually improve uh, Western medicine. So uh, for example, I think that surgical mind states before an operation are really important. And I started to practice basically a native guided imagery before I before I went into and put my hands inside a patient's body uh, and, um, you know, would stand at the sink and breathe basically a meditation. But uh, I'm a bear clan and I would walk in the bear's body and breathe his breath and gain his strength and then go and care for the patient in the operating room. Um, it extended to how we took care of uh, each other in the operating room. So basically um, paying attention to communication and interactions and creating a healing environment in that regard too. So these ways of doing surgery and these ways of creating a team are all very much uh, inclusive and uh, respectful of not just Native culture but of all people. And um, interestingly enough, n none of those things were things I was taught in my surgical training program. I was not taught how to prepare my mind. I was not taught how to interact with a team to uh, have um, harmonious interactions, and yet those improve patient outcomes. So when we started to do that, our patients began to trust us. They would come more openly and often. We started getting referrals from medicine men for gallbladder problems. Uh, and then I went to study native ceremonies and spent about a decade doing that too, uh, which we'll save for another question. <laughs> Um, well, let's go straight to the next question then, which is the, the um, I think the title of this discussion uses a phrase like beyond science, right? 
And I'm actually really interested in how both of you think about that phrase when it comes to, I think, both sort of specific spiritual practices and how they connect to medicine, and also more generally um, religious and metaphysical ideas about the human person, in the sense that it seems like there are two ways of thinking of this. One is that there are these two areas, two distinct areas, non-overlapping magisteria was uh, Stephen Jay Gould's famous uh, kind of terrible, from my perspective, phrase, right? That science and religion are just dealing with different realities and they can have mutual respect, right? Um, but, they, but they don't fundamentally overlap. And so you could take a framework like that and say, okay, we are essentially adding something to medical science from the outside, from the domain of religion that is helpful but is completely distinct. Um, or you could say, and I'm obviously, you, you can tell that I'm stacking the deck and more inclined <laughs> to the second perspective, but that there is a kind of continuum, right, where there's sort of, there are a range of ideas and practices that are definitely empirical without being sort of fully within the consensus of modern science. And then there's sort of a range where maybe there's a lower degree of empiricism, but they are still sort of attempts at knowledge about the reality of the world. But in, in that case, maybe we aren't talking about what lies beyond science. Maybe we're talking about the ways in which science extends beyond its current accepted boundaries. Um, so I'm curious what both of you think of that sort of those two ways of thinking about our discussion here. Yeah, yeah so I, I certainly, I, I personally don't subscribe to the non-overlapping magisteria kind of idea uh, because uh, th there's a, well, for a lot of reasons, uh, but, you know, I don't view natural explanations for things and supernatural explanations for things as, uh, you know, as one as any more divine or uh, wonderful or miraculous than another. Uh, to me, both are under the auspices of God. Um, and he is the author and the creator of all the natural things that we study and the supernatural experiences we might have. Um, and we have a tendency to sort of ascribe the supernatural things to God and maybe the natural things are just natural. But wh who's the author of those things? Where do those things come from, right? Um, it, it at least begs that question. So I, I have never thought about these things as uh, separate, as, as having separate sources or something like that. They all sort of fall within uh, um, God's umbrella. Um, your, your question, Ross, r reminds me actually of quotes from um, Stephen Hawking as well as Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan is a Cornellian, so we, we tend to wear him proudly at Cornell. Uh, but uh, as brilliant as he was, I'm not sure that I always agreed with a lot of the inferences that he made based on the observations that, that, he, that he had. For example, he was quite astute in, in note, noting that we live, what did he say, in a humdrum planet in a you know, sort of forgotten galaxy in some corner of, of, a, of this universe where there might even be multiple universes. So we're really pretty insignificant. Um, and, and Stephen Hawking had a similar quote where he said, you know, we're, we're just chemical scum at the end of the day, right? Um, and what, what the jump that they're making there is they're making correct and true observations about our, um, the material aspect of who we are, but then they are jumping to derive significance only from that material aspect, right? So when we talk about healing the human, we need to first think about what it means to be human, right? Um, and uh, I don't believe that we are simply a collection of cells. Uh, I don't believe that we are simply uh, the, the, the chemical and material nature that we do share with all of the rest of what's around us. That's absolutely true, right? But that is only one aspect of who we are. And so when we focus healing on only that one aspect, it's powerful, there's no doubt, right? I do research in a lab focused on that all the time, and I am aware of the power that lies within it, but it's incomplete, right? Because there's more to who we are than just our material substance. And so I think that's why healing also has to be thinking about those aspects as well. One thing I will point to is, um, and, and Lori may bring this up as well, but this, this notion of mindfulness, right? 
up until, I don't know, 2006 or so, you could probably count on my two hands the number of clinical trials that actually incorporated meditation or mindfulness in any kind of substantive way. Um, since then, maybe several hundred, right? So there's really been an explosion in the consideration of mindfulness and meditation, but this isn't a new idea. Ancient cultures all around the world, indigenous cultures, my own Indian tradition, um, and many others um, have been practicing mindfulness and meditation for quite some time, right? They may not have been done in exactly the way that clinical trials are run today, and there's value in that, right? The way that clinical trials are run, science, what it brings to the table is the ability to be able to interpret the data, um, perhaps with greater power, uh, but there's been a tremendous amount of investigation and trial and error and observation and science, if you will, in these ancient traditions that have been disregarded by modern Western science um, that I think it, it's, it's time for us to drop that hubris um, and say, what, what can we learn from these other ancient traditions that may not be squarely within the you know, Western scientific fold in the way that things are done, but certainly have contributed vast amounts of knowledge about who we are and what it means to be human. Right? And part of the reason why we don't is fear. We don't understand it, right? But we can't, we can't live out of fear. Uh, one of my favorite verses in scripture is that perfect love drives out fear, right? So if we are actually operating out of fear, um, we're not actually going to be fully human. Lori, just to pick, pick up on that, my, my impression is that something like mindfulness, while yeah, 15 or 20 years ago, it you know, was not sort of part of the normal curriculum of medical science, has been successfully integrated in part because it offers a kind of, there's a kind of generality to it, right? Where you're saying, okay, this is about, you know, this is about mind states, which are about brain states, and we can trace, you know, okay, here are the chemical pathways that are affected by it. And it's you know, it's, it's sort of a gateway into the spiritual realm for medical science, but also a some, it's still within a sort of comfortable range, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that a lot, of the, a lot of the customs and traditions that you've worked with are distinguished more by specificity, right? That it's not, that there is, you know, there is sort of obviously these elements that translate across cultures, but there's all, you know, you just mentioned sacred objects, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about sort of the specific, like, if, if, or if you disagree, say otherwise, right? But, you know, that, that's the specificity of Navajo traditions, right? Of, you know, the sort of particularity, the granularity of those, those traditions and how they fit or don't with the sort of general scientific worldview. Okay, um, so uh, first, first to acknowledge what Praveen said, um, you know, I, I think that that is a, a perfect uh, zone to uh, where there can be an easy intersection between science and, and spirituality because so many traditions do uh, use elements of mindfulness or meditation. And there's been a lot of research um, as well there. And um, I, I have quite a bit of familiarity with that, too. Uh, I had a, a practicing meditation, meditation practice for about 10 years and um, still have the ability to go there pretty fast if I need to because of the, the, the state, mind states that uh, are involved. And, um, and yeah, they, they've, they're showing changes in the brain. <coughs> Excuse me with long-time meditators that even have increased um, cortical thickness, cortical thickness in the brain as well, <clears throat> as well as um, changes in activity in prefrontal cortex and other places. So, um, so clearly things are happening. Over on the native side, um, I, I would take it from the other direction, I think, which is to talk for a moment. Let me just get this yeah. out of my throat. <laughs> Maybe it's a Navajo holy person telling me to shut up. Um, perfect, perfect, <coughs> perfect water casts perfect. out throat obstruction. Yeah, there you go. Perfect, perfect. The energy of the water is helping. Okay. So, um, 
you know, our, our belief is that um, we are part of a larger cosmos. Um, the name of that is Sa'anagai Bekehojo. Sa'anagai is male, Bekehojo is female. Sa'anagai is Father Sky, Bekehojo is Mother Earth. Very much like yin and yang uh, in that regard. But so it is a way, a life way that says that we are to live in harmony with everything around us. Uh, and everyone around us, everything around us, which include the non-human animals, includes also the insect world, the air, the earth, uh, the sky, all of it we are supposed to live in harmony with. And um, moreover, though, it is also the name of our creator. Sa'ana Mekai Bekehojo is the name of our creator, uh, which um, is the, the medicine men say that, that Sa'ana Mekai Bekehojo has a consciousness and they call it universal mind, and that we also are part of that because we were created by the creator, so we are part of that universal mind. And our consciousness is, crea is connected, we're, and we are interconnected. So that's kind of a big idea, which is shared by certain some other religions as well. Um, but if you take that particular structure or paradigm, you can see where, uh, your mind shifts in your, your ideas about other people. You don't see them as separate. You don't see them as different. You see them as part of yourself. You see them and you see the planet as part of yourself. And this is a big reason why indigenous communities are so adamant about protecting the earth and protecting our waters and, and, and our animals is because we're not separate from them. We are all connected. So if you think of things in that way, uh, guess what? A lot of stuff starts getting healed. Uh, in particular, mental disorders can be healed because when you come back into ceremony, you're reminded of that non-separateness and you're reminded of the fact that because we are all connected, we can lend ourselves to um, healing the minds of those people. Uh, Navajo ceremonies are a lot about mind purification um, and sort of restoring harmony and balance in the mind. And so you can imagine that a lot of mental states, and I'm not talking about severe mental illness by any means, but a lot of anxiety and depression are, are actually caused by a, a strong sense of ego and a strong sense of self. But when you let go of that sense of yourself and you shift your mind from worrying so much about you as an individual, you immediately become freer and less concerned about every little thing that's happening to you and more interested in what's happening to us and you start to heal. So that, that's just one example from the ceremonies, but there's, there's just so many myriad, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on connection to the natural world and uh, um, you know, one of, one of the, well, I'll share a story about that later maybe, but... Um, now, why don't you share the story? Okay. <laughs> so, this is from the Yebiche, which is um, a winter ceremony called, also called the Night Chant. It's uh, nine days long, and uh, inside of that ceremony, which was translated actually by uh, Washington Matthews for the University of Utah, and just as an aside, Washington Matthews translator was my grandmother's grandfather, Jesus Arviso, who, <laughs> tiny story inside the story, uh, he was not Navajo, he was um, Spanish, and he had blue eyes and blonde hair, oh, no, I'm sorry, blue eyes and fair skin and dark hair. In the 1800s, he was living as a child in um, northern Mexico and was captured by the Apaches and sold to the Navajos, and he became uh, a, basically a Navajo servant or you know, a prisoner of war. Um, but as he grew up, he learned Navajo, so he could speak Navajo and Spanish, and he became both the interpreter for the Navajo tribe to, for their treaty with the United States of America, but also an interpreter for Washington Matthews for this particular um, ceremony. So in the ceremony, uh, there's a story where uh, a boy has a dream, and in that dream, uh, rams with blue faces come to him, and they tell him, that the men of the tribe are hunting more game than they, than they need, and that it is throwing the universe off balance. 
and that if they continue to do this, the ram said that the holy people will make the game scarce and there will be a famine and starvation. And uh, so the boy woke up from his dream um, and he went to the hunters and he told them about the, the prophecy of the rams and they laughed at him and said, go back to your dreaming and let us do the hunting. And then the famine came and the starvation and the game were very scarce. And then they remembered this, this dream, this young boy, this story, and they resolved that they would never take more game than they needed from there on out. But not only that, they also said that they would never take more of, of anything than they needed, which gives rise to what we call subsistence culture, which is a means of drawing lightly on the earth and not over hunting, over fishing, over exploiting our planet. And um, it continues uh, to this day. That's our way of being, which I think could also heal the planet if you follow my drift. Could I, Ross, yeah, could yeah. I pick up on that real quick? Yeah. Because, um, and, and also early, this was amazing, Lori. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, and I profoundly- I had pictures too, but I couldn't <laughs> quite get that together. Anyway. I, I profoundly resonate with so much of what you said. And there, at one point you were talking about dissolving the bloated egos mm -hmm. that, that often mm -hmm. lead to the pain and the, the yeah. suffering yes. that we experience and that we end up sharing with one another um, uh, too generously. And, you know, I was, um, I, I had some revelation on this and some teaching on this and on it from an unexpected place when I was talking to an Old Testament scholar and I said, how, how do I, because I feel that very strongly, and, and there's a lot in science that actually points to that, our interdependence with other beings. I mean, just think about, we are an ecology. Your yes. single body is an ecology. There is fungus and bacteria and viruses living in your gut and in other places of your body. True. And it's not just that they're there, <laughs> but, but they are dependent on one another. Right? There's true symbiosis going on. It's a beautiful thing. We barely understand it. Um, and it's a, it's a remarkable area of study. Uh, but it's so inspiring every time I think about it, this sort of ecological body that we are. And at times it makes me think about the body of Christ and some analogies there. But I've actually wrestled to say, well, y you know, growing up when I wasn't Christian and I used to hear radio programs and such, people saying, well, the Genesis says that we have dominion. And so we can do whatever we want, right? Because we've got this sort of special place. Um, and so I went to an Old Testament scholar and I said, can you help me like reconcile these things? Because I, I, I don't know how to think through this. And he said, where did you hear that? <laughs> because that is not at all how you know, a, um, a Jewish reader of Genesis would have understood uh, that, that terminology. And he took me through a wild ride of understanding uh, a lot of what was in there. So for example, Rada, uh, which is often translated in English in dominion, and unfortunately had, dominion is a, is a word in English that comes, it's loaded and comes with all kinds of cultural expectations about what it might mean. But in ancient Jewish tradition, uh, Rada really meant like regal rule or kingly rule. And the ethical ideal of a king was service, was to lay down your life for the benefit of your subjects. There was nothing about kingship that lauded over anybody. It was just laying down of your life. And then you see that thread connect to the cross, right, where the ideal is realized in that moment, right, this laying down of oneself solely for the benefit of others and not anybody else. And suddenly all kinds of dots started connecting for me, right? But I think that connects back to what Lori was saying about how um, that that the, the laying down of oneself, right, and one's ego for the benefit of those that are around you is the starting point for healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I should, I should play the, you know, defender of hard materialism, actually, for a minute, that we have too much, too much agreement, right? Because I, um, and this is, I, I'm, I'm putting on a, putting on a part here, just so, it's, just so it's clear, right? But a big, a big part of the theory of modern medical science, right, is that yes, there are amazing harmonies, uh, and amazing, amazing harmonies in nature, um, amazing forms of symbiosis and so on, um, but the fundamental 
law of nature is predation, survival of the fittest, and so on. And a lot of those symbioses, you know, don't necessarily end well for every creature involved in the process. And the, I think, the claimed but pretty clearly real achievement of modern medical science has been to break certain natural patterns that led to, uh, you know, high rates of infant mortality, to, I mean, you know, to, take, to take the most obvious example, and to, to sort of generate longer life expectancy than um, any, pre, any pre-modern tradition that we know of was, was able to generate, right? Um, and so in certain ways, you know, the, I think the, the hard materialist question is, well, you know, this narrative that you're describing, you know, is a, a very eloquent way of describing natural realities, but, but aren't we here to transcend those realities? Aren't we here to sort of escape some of these patterns? Isn't that what, you know, raising life expectancy, curing diseases, and so on is, is all about? Um, so I just wanted to, I just wanted to offer that. Do you want to, you want me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's a really interesting question. I wonder if embedded in there is also this, uh, uh, let me take it in a couple of directions and see if that's sort of where you're, you're, what, you're what you're asking, Ross. But um, I think the question to some extent boils down to how do we assess whether we are um, healed? whether we are in a healthy place. Let me say that. How do we assess whether we are healthy? Is that longer life expectancy? Is that really, is, if that's the metric, then maybe so, right? But if the metric is actually not necessarily longer life expectancy, but how we, how we are and what our state of being is while we are around, right? Um, how we are, uh, how we feel, we may have a longer life expectancy now, but I think probably more than ever before, people say they're alone. People say they're depressed. Rates of these kinds of things, despite the globalized world that we live in and social media platforms that anybody can connect to at any time to you know, have contact, um, there's depression and loneliness and mental health problems at rates that are higher than I've certainly ever heard of um, in a long, long time. Um, and so it just begs the question of what it means to be healthy, right? And whether metrics of life expectancy uh, are, whether it really is that simple or whether it really just boils down to that or not, right? I think a, a related thing is, is, is eradicating all of suffering, physical or mental, or um, increasing lifespans to have less of that really the point of healthy living? Is that actually what we really want to do? And I think part of, I hope I can speak for you, but to correct me if I'm wrong, part of what we've been saying is that not all suffering is bad. In the sense that, um, depending on how we define it, if we are laying down ourselves, there's some pain in that. There's some pain in laying down ourselves. There's some pain in experiencing not having something, right? But if we're doing that with the mode of building up those that, who are around us, ultimately, collectively, there's going to be greater health even if there was individual suffering. So I don't know that eradicating suffering or not experiencing any pain at all is actually a good way to go about experiencing good health. And I'll do a short one. Okay. Um, well, I was thinking about it from your side, too, and I would say that uh, my grandmother's fa- father w- lived to be 107, um, very little contact with the white world, and she lived to be 92. And I would almost wonder what, what indigenous people's lifespans were before contact. Um, I have a feeling that, that natural selection probably made some very strong people, uh, because if your pelvis was too narrow to give birth, you weren't going to give birth, and you weren't going to have a daughter that had a pelvis too narrow to give birth. And so after a while, only the people that didn't have narrow pelvises gave birth. Um, and uh, you can kind of translate that to all kinds of other things, you know. And, and I, I just think from a practical perspective that uh, traditional people understand that. So that in some ways, possibly, 
by allowing people with illnesses to circumvent their illnesses through different mechanisms or, or illnesses could be detrimental to us as a whole people. I think we are committed as healers to try to heal everyone to the degree that we can. And I would also add that our creator has helped us with science and medicine. Yeah, let me, let me push on that, on that last point because Lori, if I'm, I, I, think, I think the vision that you're offering and I suspect Praveen you would agree is ultimately sup, it's, it's supplementary. It is not a rejection of the achievements of modern medicine and mm -hmm. science, right? Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, and the claim, the specific claims around, um, you know, some of the spiritual practices that you've discussed is that they do, in fact, you know, they, they offer a version of the spiritual and psychological wholeness that we're talking about, but they also help extend life, right? They do enable surgeries to go, to, you know, to go more smoothly. They do, you know, enable people to have shorter recovery times and so on. So in a way, what we're talking about is not, um, I mean, I, if you read Charles Mann's uh, book 1491 about uh, the pre-Columbian -pre America, there is actually a fascinating discussion of, mm. you know, just how impressed the Europeans were uh, with the physical condition of native populations relative to their sort of hunched, you know, 15th century London um, <clears throat> kind, kind, of, kind, of, kind of vibe. Um, but, but sort of, but I mean, but I think the promise of the spiritual or holistic turn is that you don't, you can keep the aspect of modern medical science that, for instance, enabled my wife to have four children, even though we had to have four cesarean sections, which in pre-modern world mm -hmm. would not have ended well for anyone involved. You get to keep that achievement, but you get to bring back in things that have been lost or Possibly. set aside, right? Possibly. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Possibly. Yeah, the, no, no doubt. Yeah, it's, it's not an either or, it's a both and. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, 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 it's just about thinking holistically. Um, and, but, I, but I think that often what, you, what people experience in the medical world where there isn't as much holistic thinking is this feeling that, um, that the, the, the natural methods and the modern sort of Western medicine is really equipped to tackle all of the problems that we face as humanity. And, and uh, it's just a matter of time before we can all just be healed. And um, th that, that doesn't take away from the power of science and medicine. I'm, I'm in the thick of that discipline and field and believe very strongly in the potential and the promise that it has. Uh, but, what, but I think we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that that's the end all be all, right? Because then we're really missing a huge element of what it means to be human and therefore what it means to heal a human. Mm -hmm. But so then what advice do you give, let's say, a medical practitioner operating in a secular environment, right? Where, you know, I mean, part of, if you're a surgeon in a native or indigenous community, um, you know, you face particular obstacles and hardships, but there's also sort of there's a, there's a clear sort of blueprint in a way for this kind of integration. You can say, I am practicing in this community that shares this set of beliefs, this set of ideas. I can pick up on practices that are common to the community. My patients will recognize these practices and so on. The challenge for someone at a, you know, a large hospital in Boston, right, in a diverse, secular, multi-faith society is is different um, and and distinctive, and I'm I'm curious how you go from ideally the sort of specificity of particular traditions to, and if you can, right, to a kind of universal. You know, is there a sort of universal blueprint for integrating integrating spiritual practice into medicine, or is it more like you know you meet your patient where they are? Your patient is a Christian, you respond in a particular way. Your patient is a Buddhist, you respond in a particular way. What, what do you guys think of that question? I have some thoughts, but I'd love to hear Lori. So. No, go ahead. You, you sure? <laughs> I think well, we so. can. Okay. You can I'll, both I'll, go. Like That's the magic <laughs> of the. Yeah, right. Um, I, I think it is really, really challenging in the current context um, because medicine has become so rapid fire. 
I actually think of, uh, I hope this isn't too challenging of an analogy, but um, I actually think of factory farming. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of increase in technology that has enabled factory farms, right? But just because we can, and just because it does have a benefit in according to one parameter, right, output, right, or certain kinds of meats or whatever it might be, doesn't mean that we should because there's a profound uh, um, ripping of dignity of the, the, the sacred things, in my opinion, the things that are connected to God because they were made by God. Um, so uh, just because science affords you the opportunity to do something doesn't mean that it actually is healing in the, in the sort of holistic sense, right? So while medicine is really, really powerful, the way that we are applying medicine is often so disconnected. I would say that we ought to start by putting connection back into the practice of medicine. I have a lot of medical conditions. Many of them are unexplained. It's rather mysterious. I really don't know why. And I'm, I'm sort of curious to see whether I'll find out on this side of heaven. But um, it's, it's uh, really troubling and frustrating as someone who has a stable job and a good income and you know, good health insurance, that it still, when I have chronic and debilitating medical conditions, takes months for me to see a doctor and I might get two minutes with him, right? Um, when, it feels like, when it's as serious as I might need immediate surgery or whatnot, right? So I don't know exactly what the solution is, but the, there's clearly a problem where we are not connecting. We're not connecting. So I, I don't expect my doctor to know that I'm a Christian or to try to talk, with, but at minimum, I'd like to be a human. Right? I would. I would not. I, I don't want to just be cattle going through, or you know, you know, uh, just uh, harvesting the corn. Uh, not that those don't have their own sacred places, but I would like to interact and connect as a human. I, I think that should be the starting point. Um, even though, yes, your expertise is the way you know how to treat my bodily injury, perhaps diagnose it, give me the correct prognosis, etc. But I'm also, I have anxiety, I'm, I'm troubled by this, I haven't been able to see you. There are all kinds of other things that are related that are going, down and, and going on and I'd love to be able to connect with my physician about that. But I don't get a holistic experience with him, I barely even get two minutes with him. So I think that would be the starting point. And, and I don't know that we could start that late either. I think in the training of medical professionals, we need to start talking about these kinds of issues. It can't be that they go through medical training and everything's about anatomy and everything's about physiology and surgery, and then they become practicing, you know, practitioners of medicine, and it's too challenging at that point to start to put the human element in if they haven't been trained to think about it throughout the process. But you, she, you, Lori's an actual doctor, so you should listen to her. Yeah, Lori, so I've come to you as a patient. Yeah. I'm not native, I'm not Navajo. Right. right. Tell me what yeah. it means for me. Sure. So um, I, you, you spoke of, of people coming from various traditions and backgrounds and religions, but uh, I think Praveen was, hit it right on the nail when he said uh, he's a person, he's a human, and he wants that interaction as a human. And I think it's valuing that person and that human and that human's body that's at the very core of that. And um, so as you were talking, some things came to mind for me for some, a couple of patients recently. And so, you know, it's, it's not like we actually even have the time to be able to do that for every single patient that we see. Um, but some patients need that a whole lot more than others. Um, for my patient who's getting a routine colonoscopy, it, it's probably fine if I just know that he knows what he needs to do and I know what I need to do and we go do it, right? He does his bowel prep and I do the colonoscopy. But for example, I just had a, he, he's a little white child, 14 year old, who had a ruptured appendix and we did a laparoscopic appendectomy and um, Postoperatively, he had what's called an ileus. It's where the bowel doesn't work very quickly, and um, he he was very worried and anxious. And uh, we 
waited until he started passing gas and having bowel movements, and we started to feed him, and all was going well, and then it wasn't. And then he was sick, and he was throwing up and vomiting, and we got a CT scan, and he had a bowel obstruction or an ileus, or, and we had to go all the way back to the beginning along with the nasogastric tube and, and go again. And the next time we tried, he did better, and he went home. But then he started to have some symptoms again. So for him, his mom and I were talking on a regular basis almost every day. And that's where the level of care went up, and that's where the attention went up, and that's where the communications went up. Um, I have another guy who had um, uh, basically had had a, uh, a hernia procedure and had an infection afterward, and we had to open the wound and start dressing changes and stuff. And once again, they're scared, they're afraid, they're worried. The communication goes way up. His, his wife has my cell phone number. And then he had to move to California in the middle of all of it. So we had to find people to take care of him down there and, and move through. But it's what patients want is they want you there. They want you with them, walking with them, helping them, and caring for them at the level that they need it. And I think that we can do a lot better as practitioners in that way. And that can be inclusive of their beliefs and spirituality. So. Uh, we're going to turn to your questions, but I did promise a certain degree of weirdness. And while this has been wonderful, I feel like I need to elevate the weird weirdness enough. with one, one last moderator's question, which is we've been talking about spirituality as something that informs science and informs medicine. And um, I know Lori has possible answers to this, if you have answers as well. I'm curious about... Um, the use of science to study the spiritual and the supernatural. Um, meaning, are there tools of science that we could use or maybe are using to understand supernatural realities, to cross those magisteria in the opposite direction, if you will? Um, and yeah, particularly for Lori, but if you, if you have views as well, Praveen, I'd love to hear them. And then we'll go to you guys. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, th there are. Uh, it's pretty common in in native uh, traditional circles to um, refer to the ancestors, who are the ones who have passed on. We 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 reference them, and we pretty much include them in whatever we're doing. Uh, they're considered to be present. They're considered to be part of our communities, and. Uh, some, some have dreams from the ancestors. They come in dreams, usually. Um, they've had many personal dreams of my father, especially, who passed in uh, 93. And um, he, he actually um, uh, had suffered from alcoholism and, um, and that from psychological disturbances of being a native person in a white world, for that matter. But um, he came back and in the dreams, he's he's whole and he's restored and he's very healthy and uh, he's he's actually chopping wood with a shirt off as a 35 year old or so and uh, it's very helpful to me. Um, but uh, there are these these um, very courageous, I would say, scientists who are trying to understand. Uh, is there anything left, anything after we die? What happens after we go? What, what's on the other side? Is there another side? Uh, we, you know, this has been a big unknown for most of the world. And uh, so there's, a, there's some scientists who actually are um, studying um, a group, some small children who can remember past lives with great accuracy. And that's now getting documented, and, and uh, um, I think they're out of the University of Virginia. Um, with, with, it makes, you know, they're too young to be able to make this stuff up usually, and uh, yet they're, they're very graphic, you know. He said one, I remember one here reading a story where he said, you know, he used to be a miner, and he described in pretty good detail how miners do what they do, and had never seen anything related to mining or whatever. Um, and then there are other people studying near-death experiences and um, finding that people uh, have had complete cardiac arrests and uh, then come back to give, to relate stories of being welcomed on the other side uh, by relatives and uh, 
feeling an immense peace around it all that changed their entire lives uh, so that they were no longer afraid. Uh, and um, I'll tell one story. This is a story that made me start paying attention to this in the first place. I was um, helping start a new medical school at Central University uh, College of Medicine, and uh, one of our faculty was a biochemist. And one day he sat me down and told me a story, and he said, he was probably in his 60s, but he said uh, that he had, had uh, I think he was going in for something routine in the hospital, but he was given an antibiotic, I think it was a penicillin, and he's had, he was allergic to it, and he had an anaphylactic reaction. And um, he coded, and... Uh, he told me that he could see the code from above. He saw all of it. He even saw somebody running down the hallway to get the code cart. He could see through the wall from up above. And that uh, then he started to move away from where he was. And he was getting pulled toward a light and toward um, people welcoming him there. And, uh, and he was kind of ready to go that way. <laughs> And then he said, the next thing I knew, I woke up and I had been uh, out for two days. I had been intubated and then finally was extubated and I was awakened. And he said, um, this is what really hit me. He said, I've never told anyone this story. And I said, why not? And he said, because my reputation as a scientist could be tainted by this. And I, you were the only person that I knew that I thought would understand. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> okay, yeah, I do believe you. I do believe you because you're a scientist and you you would not be saying this because all it would do is hurt your 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 career. You're only telling me because you trust me and because this really happened to you. And that's when I started paying attention to the to the literature and um, there's some work being done by Gary Schwartz, who has a whole lab down in University of Arizona, trying to actually make contact with people on the other side with some early um, interesting results. So I'll stop there. I'll, I'll just add one uh, sort of vignette or story here with regard to this. My, my mother died when I was very young, when I was four, um, in a car accident in, near, near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, immediately prior to that, that was in September, immediately prior to that, we had been in India. And my father had taken, uh, the, there were three of us at the time, and uh, my mother to a, a priest in a temple that we frequented um, to be blessed. And the priest, the, the, this Hindu priest, um, took a look at my mother and ran inside. And uh, had never done anything like that before. Um, and. Uh, later, we found out from some of the folks who were assisting him uh, that he had said, how can I bless someone who's going to die? Um, and I, I never knew this story uh, until much, much later in life. And I, I just, it pops up in my mind all the time and is, it, it has the function in my life of humbling me because I have no idea <laughs> how he knew or what he was tapping into there, right? Um, but I, I share this story because when I have, there's only a few people that I've told this actually. Some of them have been scientists and some of them have been Christians. And, and both have been resistant to, not, not of my personal story, I mean you can't, stories are stories, right? But in terms of how real this is, or whether it's possible, or whether it's explainable, or that kind of thing, right? Um, and I don't claim to have an explanation uh, from, from really any point of view or perspective. I, I just don't know. And um, that's really all that I have to add, actually, right? Is that it's okay to not know and to take a humble posture. We don't have to know everything as Christians, and we don't have to know everything as scientists. We're exploring. We're figuring things out. I have never once found that story, as perplexing as it is, to be in conflict with who I am as a scientist or to be in conflict with who Jesus means to me. Um, neither of those things have been, it hasn't created problems for me, right? And it's not because I tried to sort of sweep it under the metaphysical rug, uh, but because um, I don't know. And if everything in this space is immediately knowable to me, 
it's not that interesting, right? Like, I know that I'm not that smart. So it, it, it's okay that it's not knowable, and, and maybe that's not a bad place to end an event like this, right? Is we don't have to know everything. A humble posture towards some of these questions uh, may, may, may take us into interesting spaces, and that's okay, right? It's okay to ask those questions. I, I would add one more little story, which is that my nephew is in his young 20s, and a few years ago, he had a very bad car accident. Uh, he rolled his pickup. He was not actually injured, but he says that his life flashed before his eyes, his whole life flashed before his eyes, and he felt a spiritual presence very strongly, and, uh, and he became a Christian. And... Uh, He's trained in engineering from Purdue and kind of just wants to go be a youth pastor, <laughs> which it's all right, you know, it's just fine. You do what you, you, do what you need to do. Um, so, yeah, there's things out there in the universe that we don't really know yet. Good, those answers did not disappoint me. Um, <clears throat> let's take some questions from the audience. One of the things that came to mind when you said something that just because we can, we shouldn't. Uh, was CRISPR, and I was wondering if uh, you could, if you guys had any thoughts on what is the responsible use of CRISPR, especially without diminishing our humanity. Yeah, do you want to just briefly say what CRISPR? I mean, yeah, I absolutely. Assume. Yeah, so for those who may not be as familiar, um, CRISPR or the technology that we use for CRISPR was just recently uh, awarded for a Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Jennifer Daunda and uh, Emmanuel Charpentier. Um, so it's often dubbed genetic scissors, but it's a, a, a mechanism, a means by which to be able to edit our genomes and edit any genome really, right? So this is, uh, you know, a technology that can be applied to plants and to animals and, and human beings and to cells in a dish, right? So there are all kinds of applications. Um, just to, to be clear, if, if we want to talk about this as genetic engineering or genetic genome editing, uh, th that concept and the technologies for that concept um, are, are not new. Right? What makes this so impressive is that it is probably the most accurate methodology that can be done very, very cheaply and quite easily. Right? So it's almost it's the democratization of genome editing, if you will, that just makes this such a buzz, um, both for good and bad things. Malaria, uh, sorry, sickle cell disease, um, could likely be cured because of the advent of CRISPR-Cas9 technology. A um, couple of people have gone through clinical trials. It's been more than a year. They are in remission, no uh, uh, untoward effects. Uh, incredibly exciting. This is a crippling, devastating disease in sub-Saharan Africa and a lot of places in South America. Um, to be on the brink of being able to eradicate sickle cell disease, um, I'm, it's hard to contain myself every time I think about it, right? But then at the same time, we have the case in China, right, with the generation of what are, you know, is being dubbed CRISPR babies, right? Um, and they, they've been, it, it's germline or embryo editing that then went on to create human beings, right, that are now uh, living and being monitored in China. Um, extraordinarily dangerous uh, because as accurate as this methodology is, we have not worked out all the kinks of the kinds of off-target effects that could occur, first of all, right? So um, the, the, the uh, region of the genome that was chosen to edit is not actually medically, uh, um, there's no consensus that that would really even be a, a good thing to do. Um, and third, we don't even have legal and ethical frameworks in place for how to think about editing of individuals such that those changes then get carried on from generation to generation, right? We have some legal framework for parents making decisions for their children, but not for their descendants, you know, four generations later. We don't even have a legal framework for this, right? So even within the scientific community, much less ethical, Right? So even within the scientific community, there's a whole lot of let's pump the brakes and before we start talking about germline editing, you know, so that means sperm or egg or embryo so that it can become uh, a human being, before we start doing that, we really need to be thinking carefully about um, all of these kinds of legal, ethical, and scientific issues that still need to be worked out. Right? 
Um, which is why I think that it's really important that we have people with holistic spiritual perspectives at the table in helping make these kinds of decisions. Right? But at the same time, as far as a technology for use in a research lab to be able to study the functions of different parts of the genome, we do that routinely and now can do it much more accurately and cheaply. So I'm a big fan of it. It just depends, you know, when people often ask me, is this technology evil? Is it bad? Is it good? And I usually say, it's not the technology that's ever bad or good. It's, it's how and why we are using that technology. And I think that's where we need to be cautious. There are certain applications, this is a, a lifesaver and a healer. And there are other applications where we need to pump the brakes and think really carefully. Uh, in your discussion, you talked quite a bit about incredulous reactions from people within the scientific community to integrating holistic practices into medicine. But I'm curious also, in the, the effort to integrate more of this into the, the field of medicine, is there pushback to be expected from um, for-profit lobbies like hospital lobbies, pharmaceutical lobbies um, that see medicine primarily as a for-profit industry as well as being something for the health of society and individuals. So could you say a bit about um, how we could face those challenges in trying to integrate more holistic medicine? Yeah, I wish I could answer it better than I'm going to, so I, <laughs> uh, I just think it's a really, really good and important question. But I don't know that, that I have an answer because haven't, we haven't gotten far enough to know, in my opinion. But do I anticipate that that'll happen? Yes, because our system's broken. And um, yeah. you know, there, there is a lot of uh, drug development that is wrapped up in a for-profit industry, as I think we're all quite familiar with, um, that derails um, certain avenues that might actually be advantageous for health but are not really advantageous for the bottom line for some companies, right? And might promote others which may not even be as efficacious but could potentially be applicable to a broader set of folks and therefore help the bottom line for pharmaceuticals. So it's, it's already a major issue. And so if we start talking about, you know, repurposing Ayurvedic medicines, right? Um, and uh, democratizing you know, help, helping scientific and other communities to appreciate what already exists um, based on the, as was alluded to in the beginning by both me and Lori, the wealth of knowledge and resources and information from all kinds of other cultures and ancient traditions, uh, that is a threat to uh, the pharmaceutical industry, I would imagine, right? So how exactly the, the lobbying is gonna take place there and how we can combat it, I, I don't know enough to be able to say that. But is it an issue? I suspect it will be. My, my suspicion is that it is a, the way it cashes out, if you will, <laughs> most, most directly is, it's a research quest. It's a question of, um, th there is a, a strong limit on how much research gets done outside the drug you know, expensive drug pipeline, right? Um, so it's not, you know, th there is in fact a booming market in alternative medicine yeah. of all kinds. It, it is an industry, right? Yeah. It is, um, yeah. it, in fact, this is often a critique of, you know, that, mm -hmm. oh, you know, that sort of people are pushing supplements and enzymes on right. you, you know, all the, the endless aisles in the, the health food store that, you know, when I was really sick, I used to peruse and you just pull a, you know, 27 different herbs into your cart and try them all, <laughs> try them all. empirically, of course. <laughs> sure. um, but it's the, the, the place, so, so it's not that, you know, it, it's not that, that holistic medicine is sort of free from, co from sort of the corruptions of commerce in some way. It's perfectly commercialized in certain ways, but it's that these treatments and cures are never going to be, you know, the, whether it's the pill or the meditative practice or, you know, whatever, they, they aren't likely to be the huge money makers for drug companies that these sort of specially designed, highly tailored and targeted drugs are, and therefore you get less research, yeah. less like really rigorous, well-funded research. Like just in the case of my own experience with, with Lyme disease, Lyme disease, you know, in, in both its acute and chronic form is treated with 
either very basic antibiotics, which are not particularly expensive to make and get, or some sort of range of um, you know, herbal and natural medicines. And in neither case is there some clear financial incentive for drug companies to run amazing trials, because if the end point of the trial is, well, you need to take some extra doxycycline, well, doxycycline is not a drug that a drug company is going to get rich on, right? So, so with, and this is true, I think, with a lot of chronic conditions, you know, it's harder to get, um, it's harder to get research funding because the suspicion is the treatment is just not going to be some huge money maker in the end. That, that would be my partial thought. I did want to add that there, many, many medicines have been mined from indigenous peoples and uh, the rainforest and other plants have uh, botanicals that have been known to be helpful uh, have been incorporated by Big Farm and uh, Native people have not received any part of that uh, con compensation. Yeah, so uh, the question that I have is, uh, is there a room in science for miracles? Uh, more specifically, is there room for miraculous healing in science? And because I happen to believe that the other way around, that there is room in miracles or miracles healing for science, and I can explain why. A couple of quick examples. I am sitting in my office in Sao Paulo, Brazil, 1985. I have a prompting. As a Christian believer, it was a prompting from the Holy Spirit. The prompting says, stop everything that you're doing, pray, somebody is in danger of dying. So the first thing that comes to mind is family. My wife, my children, what's going on? I call them, everything is okay. But just obeying, stop everything, actually move away from my desk, kneel by the door of my office, and pray for this person or for this danger that I did not know. A couple of weeks later, I learned that the wife of a gentleman who, is, who, who used to be my boss, at that very moment that I prayed, had had a massive car accident, over 40 bones broken, was fighting for her life. And she was not even given a chance that she could walk. Fast forward one year, one year later, this woman is walking with a cane. To me, and to my wife and myself, it was miraculous healing, but it took a miracle, but it also took doctors who had been equipped by God Almighty to be able to produce that miracle. So that's one where I saw the two operating. The other one was 1972, I get into smoking. My wife then, fiance says, Bad idea, don't smoke. No, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to smoke. And I went up to two packs a day. Okay, that was before knowing Christ as my savior. 75, now I know Christ as my savior. And I remember a Bible scripture saying, my body was the temple of God and that I could not abuse it with cigarettes. So now, in my human strength, I want to stop smoking. But I tried. The Belgians had some pipes, five pipes. You use this one, and by the time you get to the fifth, you would stop smoking. Four years, I tried. No success. And then I tell our prayer group, I have a problem. Can you pray for me? Instead of praying that I would stop smoking, they pumped me with all kinds of questions. At the end, they concluded that my problem wasn't smoking, it was pride. And they prayed that God would deal with my pride. <laughs> the next day, I stopped smoking, totally. When I stopped, my wife for three days did not know I had stopped. So to me, both 
examples miracles. So I am putting the question, is there room <laughs> in science for miracles? Yeah. Are miracles the exception? Or can, or are they, it's sort of the place where the beyond science seems, the beyond part seems strongest. But what do you, what do you think? I think that in most of science, there is not yet room for miracles. Um, I think science always wants to um, have an empiric reason for everything. And when science doesn't have that reason, and it can't be explained by what we know so far, by physics or by, you know, some, any number of different disciplines. If, they, if none of the disciplines can explain it, then science doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, which is not to say that it won't eventually be understood. I feel that sometimes science is very short-sighted in these ways, but I think it's getting better and more open to trying to explore some of these realms than it used to be, and probably because of the change in over the generations of people coming into science used to be some, well, anyway, kind of like my surgical mentors. They were very paternalistic and arrogant and you know, only believed that they had any idea of how to do things. So there are more people that are trying to understand the world in a highly diversified way, and so things may change to try to understand it better. That, that's probably as good as I'll get it with that. Yeah, and, and I think I'll, I'll also add um, that I, I think um, science may not have any business to say one way or the other. I think a lot of what I try to, to, to point out to folks is that it is by definition agnostic. We can talk about the definition and whether that should change, but mm -hmm. by definition it is agnostic with respect to the supernatural and to miracles, right? So any claim about whether or not supernatural can happen by purely scientific tools is an overreach, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that, that's what I would say is that it gives room for the miraculous, even mm -hmm. if it isn't necessarily subsuming the miraculous. Mm -hmm. yeah. One other thing is even within the last hundred years, what, what things have changed dramatically. Many, 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 many invisible things that we didn't understand, that phenomena, have now we understand. We understand microwaves, we understand uh, gamma rays, we understand any infrared, we understand UV light. We, there's so many things out there that we were out there and we didn't know, you know? Our, our grandparents didn't know they were out there and if a phenomena happened secondary to one of those things, they'd probably be like, oh, that was something really spiritual or weird or whatever. And yet, so, so what I'm saying is that our understanding of our universe continues to expand and things may be understood later. Yeah, I totally agree. And I would also add that um, I, I usually get a little nervous when science makes claims that are beyond its purview. Mm -hmm. So if it's saying that miracles can't happen, or if it's saying that one day we will definitely explain all mm -hmm. miracles, both, although I'm not disagreeing no, whatsoever with the agree. fact that it I can potentially agree. explain more, um, but the, the, the notion that it, all things are natural at the end of the day and therefore we'll get there um, is, I think, equally problematic to the, the, the notion of there is no such thing as anything beyond the material, so it must not be real. I think both are potentially problematic, which puts science, again, in a sort of humble posture of we can do this really well. Anything we can measure or quantify, right? Science has got really good tools and is well equipped to be able to tackle those. And beyond that, I think there should just be an openness. Mm -hmm. So this question just occurred to me, so it might not be well formed, as, so please forgive. Um, but I was wondering if there is a, if there's something more to a religious experience than not knowing its origins, or like something just happened, I can't explain this, this, is, this must be divine. Personally, I think religious experience sometimes is the opposite, where I know exactly that this is 
God telling me, or I know exactly that this actually makes sense, these connections are being made in my life, and this is so much, like, I might, I might appear insane to you, but actually this is the most sober I've ever been, and this is like, I understand. There's understanding in that experience that might not be explicable. And so I was wondering if there's a distinction there between a religious experience and just encountering an unknown phenomena. Um, and then with the religious experience, you may not know if it's an experience uh, that's divine or not, but then somehow it's also corroborated by other sorts of religious experiences that you have, and consistently there's like this distinctive quality to it that, um, that makes it verifiable in a, in a sense. Um, so yeah, that, that's my question. Let's take one more from this side, right in the front. Um, responding to uh, something that you were just talking about, about uh, sort of uh, whether or not science sort of claims full domain over, over uh, the things that are unknown and, and um, you know, will eventually be known in science, um, do you think it's dangerous for uh, faith perspectives to try and apply the, the label of um, miracle or faith or something like that to something in the case that in 50 years we'll have a scientific explanation yeah. and then it'll be, ah, you religious people, you were being foolish all along. Yeah. How, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I think these questions are actually linked. Are, are we answering them now? Is that okay? You, you, you can. I'm, I'm going to really cheat and throw in one last one, though, too, <laughs> which is since you mentioned the word danger, I'm going to just, I, this has been in my mind throughout, but um, do, do we think there are zones of knowledge, spiritual knowledge or experience that are potentially dangerous? I'm wondering if, if either of you could throw that one in too. So, yeah, yeah. that's it. Go for it. Take yeah. it away. So, so I, 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 I love this, and I think it's a great way to end. And my feeling is that these are linked, and forgive me if I'm maybe not capturing the, the, the fullness of your questions. Um, I've actually gotten to a place where I, I, I don't think of religious experiences as different than even what I'm experiencing right now talking to you. I feel like the, sort of going back to what I was saying in the beginning, things that have, material things that have explanations, natural explanations that we can work out as scientists, um, unexplainable phenomena that might eventually have natural explanations, and unexplainable phenomena that maybe never will have uh, natural explanations. These are all, crudely speaking, perhaps the bins that we could use for our various experiences. All of those are religious to me, in the sense that they are all, because all of this is sacred, right? Um, and all these interactions are sacred. So I don't view one as more religious than another. But I think perhaps what you're getting at is that third bin, of, and maybe the second and the third bin of unexplained phenomena, right? And to what extent are we going to be able to explain them or, uh, or not explain them? To get to, to, to your question maybe first, um, sometimes we refer to this as the God of the gaps, right? Where we don't have an explanation, so we, we invoke God, right? Um, and then, you know, rainbow is this often used example of this, right? Like, oh, that's a sign from God, right? Um, and then we realize like, oh, this is physics, right? But those aren't two different things. <laughs> you could have physics and also have it be a sign from God, right? So uh, a natural explanation for something doesn't take away from God's authorship of that explanation, right? It actually just provides a wonderfully surprising color to actually how God might do that. Well, oh, okay, apparently it's not with a paintbrush, but it's through a different process, right? So yes, I do think that it could be a little dangerous, and so I, I, I think just, again, that humble posture of this is all a religious experience, whether I can explain it right now or not, whether we will ever be able to explain it or not, we'll fight, we'll see. Right? But to me, it's all an opportunity to worship, right? Because then it, we just stop and we say, wow. Whether I, it's so cool that God paints the sky in this particular way. Versus in ancient times, oh my gosh, God is painting with a paintbrush or whatever someone may have thought, right? Um, both are opportunities to worship, right? And we just take the no additional knowledge that we have and work that into our religious experience. What comes for me to mind for me is is uh, 
you know, coming back to a, a native idea of everything being deeply interconnected. Uh, I think for you, for example, saying when you know or you feel that you're being guided and they're uh, guided by God and there are validation points along the way and it doesn't feel mysterious, you know, yeah, that that's definitely a way it could happen, I think. It doesn't have to be so, you know, unusual. And then the, the dangerous part, you know, yeah, you could get in front of things and say this was, this happened because of a, you know, this was a spiritual thing that happened and unexplainable and then later science comes along and explains it. But if we work from a premise, at least that, you know, most, most theologies and certainly Navajo and certainly Christian is that God made everything, right? So uh, whether or not we understand every single part of his science, you know, is, is uh, you know, is probably arrogant to think that, and, and I don't think most of us do think that. I think we, we, we are very, very pleased when we unlock another piece of the universe and understand it, how it functions, because it's such an elegant, elegant universe with all of its physical principles and its math and its beauty. Oh my God, how is it that God made so many things that are just not only functional but beautiful in nature, beyond beautiful? It's like, imagine the abilities of, of a creator like that, you know. So, so it's almost like you just kind of have to step back and say, you know, we're part of this and maybe we'll get the whole picture at some point, maybe we won't, but you know, it's all good. It reminds me of C.S. Lewis said, um, God is wild, right? He is not tame, nor can he be tamed. Yeah, yeah, Right. yeah. And so I, I, I bring that sensibility to my process of scientific discovery, or not the process, but perhaps my experience upon scientific discovery. I, I sort of have this mindset of being, ex I expect to be surprised, you know? Um, and I expect to learn new things, I expect to discover, and when I do, it's, it's an opportunity, it's an invitation to have a spiritual or, or worshipful experience. 